draw something up here on the board for you, okay? Well, okay. okay, you know, Jesus is the Christ. So I'm, I'm going to put two categories up here. Christ and Antichrist. Now, I think you know this, but the word Christ is Greek. The Greek translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach, which is Messiah. But a Messiah or a Christ simply means one who is anointed to fulfill a particular office or a, a service. Um, you know, when we... Uh, elect a president, we say that we have anointed that person. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's come along and poured olive oil over his head, even though that's what in the Old Testament they did when a priest or a king was, uh, came into their office. But the, the Greek word has an additional meaning uh, about it being a, a touch or a point of contact. You know, if you touch uh, a live electrical wire, you, you will get a jolt. You will, you will get some power, some energy will, will uh, contact you. Well, that is implied in the meaning of the word uh, anoint. It's more than just a, you know, olive oil. Well, I mean, look, back in the day, what did they use olive oil for? They used it for nearly everything, kind of like what we do with petroleum today, right? You know, and the electricity that, that burns our lights and stuff, a lot of it is, is burning fossil fuel of some kind, whether it's oil or maybe coal. Um, but point being that when something is anointed, there is a power behind that force or that entity or that regime, if you will, that anoints the person. So we're talking about two kingdoms here. We're talking about God's kingdom and we're talking about Satan's kingdom, obviously. Okay, so we as human beings can come in contact with that which is of God or that which is of the devil, right? Well, what we're talking about today may be, hopefully, Lord willing, will help us not get deceived or not get confused about what is of God or what is of the devil. Now, I think most of us, we're, we're not we, spring chickens here, so we've had some experience uh, finding out what's of God and what isn't. But we've got to, we got to stay, you know, on the ball with that. We can't let our guard down because <clears throat> the word tells us what's coming. Turn to John chapter 10. Here is a familiar scripture. While you're turning there, let me point out what the word anti means. Well, we think we know what the word anti means. It means to be against something. But according to Strong's Concordance, there's a little bit more meaning to be had with anti. It can mean instead of. It can mean an alternative to. Just like um, Splenda is an alternative to sugar. Okay? Or, or Stevia. Or, or uh, you know, you name it. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't use that stuff. But anyway. Or it can denote uh, a response to something. <coughs> you know, in a courtroom. Uh, they, they have one side, the defense will um, interrogate a witness. Then the, um, you know, the state will interrogate the witness and they cross-examine them. Well, that, that's 
a response that's in response to what the first one did. Or, you know, they've been doing this thing lately on TV at a State of a Union address. After the, the president gives his State of Union address, they, somebody from the opposing party gets to say their, their bit about what the president just said. Well, that's anti. Yeah. That's, that's in the meaning of anti. And another meaning of anti means it is a substitute for that. Like back to Splenda and Sugar or Stevie or whatever, one of the reasons why those things are substitutes is supposedly they're supposed to uh, mimic the characteristics of the, the thing that they are substituting. That, that's key here for us to understand what is Christ and what is Antichrist. In other words, if Christ, if anointing means that you will feel something, or you will experience a, a power transmission to you from an outside source, then that's something which the devil will mimic, will substitute what the real thing is. We'll, we'll get into this today. John chapter 10, verse 10, a very, a very familiar scripture to us here. It says, The thief comes only in order to steal kill and destroy. I come that they may have an enjoyed life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Well, you know, you could almost say the thief comes only to steal. It's like, well, duh. But see, this is the point is the thief doesn't have a, a, a t-shirt that says thief across the front, right? So he comes like he's a, an, an air conditioner repairman or something else, right? So, you know, you, you, you wouldn't necessarily know by their appearance whether they're a thief or not, okay? But you've got to keep in mind, if they are a thief, that is why they have come. They have come to do mayhem. They have not done, come to do you any good. And they will lie about that. Because, see, the word thief in Greek, uh, kleptos, from which we get the word like kleptomania, uh, it actually means to be an imposter, to be a plagiarist. You know, we, we say this all the time, that the devil's a plagiarist. Well, he, that's, that's in the meaning of the word thief. Okay, so there's a couple of things here we can say about Christ versus Antichrist right off the bat. The Antichrist is a imposter. Jesus and that which is of him is true. You know, he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Okay, so that which is of God is true, incontrovertially true. And that which is of the devil is pretending to be true but false. Not just that it's false, but it's false pretending to be true. That's key. Okay, another thing that is said here is what the thief comes to do versus what Jesus comes to do. The thief comes to, of course, steal, kill, and destroy. I'll just summarize that with the word destruction. And I'll summarize what Jesus does in form of life. I mean, there's a lot of D words that come under this. There's death. There's despair, there's divorce. All the D words come under what the Antichrist does. Disease. A lot of D words go in here, right? Okay. Go to, keep the place here in John. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Verse 13. Now, when Jesus 
went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, key word here, we'll get back to that in a minute, just, just kind of underline that word disciple. This is key. Because God wants us to be disciples. All right? He asked his disciples, who do people say that I am, that I, the Son of Man, am? And they answered, well, some say John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, or others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Well, why would these people who, you know, as we read through the Gospels, they had seen miracles, you know, they, they, they'd been healed, they'd heard his words, and they say, hey, this guy's got some truth. He's saying stuff the Pharisees never taught us in the synagogue. So how could they uh, experience all this and still not know he was of God? Well, because they were not disciples. They were not walking with him daily like Paul, I mean like Peter, and like James and John. See, so to know who Christ is, not just to know who Jesus is, but to know what is of God and is not of God requires a close, daily, intimate relationship with Jesus. You know, if you wonder, well, how could some of these things go on in the church that are so wrong? You know, Steve talked about this Friday night. This is really kind of a continuation of what Steve started on Friday night. All these things that are going on that are, that are leading the church down a primrose path to the wrath of God, how could, they, how could they buy that stuff? Well, they're not living in a close, intimate, daily fellowship with Jesus, which is what a disciple is. So, therefore, they didn't really know if he was just another prophet or he was, you know... He was a, an avatar. He was just a man who got a, you know, a better idea floated down to him from God. Or he was a reincarnation. See, if he was uh, one of the prophets, uh, of course, I guess they understood that Elijah was taken away in a whirlwind, so I guess they, they still expected Elijah would come back. But anyway, they didn't know who he was. But keep reading. So Jesus asked them, but who do you, my disciples, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, well, blessed and happy and fortunate and to be envied are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Well, why would that matter? What, Paul, what Peter saw in Jesus versus what the others saw in Jesus? Well, it matters a great deal. It matters for everything. Keep the place here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Because if you're walking in that close, intimate fellowship with Jesus, like the old song in the garden, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. If you're walking in that relationship, then not just recognizing his identity or recognizing false doctrine from true doctrine and things within the religious realm. Not just all of that will be yours if you're walking with Him. Well, I'll just read it. What's yours? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural, non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God. See, what Jesus told Peter was that he had had a revelation of the Spirit of God. Well, a, a person who's not walking with Jesus doesn't get revelations from the Spirit of God unless they get the revelation, hey, you're a sinner, you need to repent and get saved. I mean, he'll, he'll do that. 
for they are folly, meaningless nonsense to him. And he's incapable of knowing them because they are spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciated. But the spiritual man tries all things. And that doesn't mean he experiments with them. It means he uh, investigates, he inquires into, examines, and discerns all things. Like all things, not just religious things, but, you know, political things, economic things, gardening things. Because he gets it from the Holy Spirit. Yet he is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or appraise or get an insight into him. Go back to the Gospel of John. Keep the place in 1 Corinthians. You've got a lot of places to keep today. Go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. My point is that this close, intimate, daily fellowship with the Lord is key to us having that that we just read there in 1 Corinthians. What I'm saying is it would not be enough just to say, well, I got saved back in 1980, whatever it was, and so, so that's mine. It, you know, all, all the promises in the book are mine. Well, yes, all the promises in the book are, you, are yours, provided something. Well, what is that? I'm so glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. John chapter 8, verse 31. So Jesus said to those who believed in him, if, see this, if is a condition, if you abide in my word. See, abiding means a continual daily experience of something. If you abide in my word, hold fast to my teachings and live in accordance with them. In other words, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. Like what Steve was talking about. It's easy to just warm a pew. There's a difference between standing on the promises and sitting in the premises. Okay. All right. If you live accordance with my teaching, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There is a wonderful assurance that we have here that if we will just continue walking with the Lord and talking to Him, we will not be deceived by that guy. You know, I, I through my Christian life, as I've learned more and more about end times, sometimes I've had anxiety about, well, this deception that the devil's bringing is, is pretty great. And, you know, you look at what's going on in the world today and, and you say, wow, there, there's great men of God that have been deceived. You know, I, I remember back in the day having a conversation with Owen and he was, he was making the, the point, which is a valid point, that basically all the denominations who have, you know, they've banded together as the World Council of Churches and so forth, that they're kind of, it's kind of like the United Nations, uh, you know, in New York City, that it's all, uh, you know, coming together as one and, and it's all going to be under the Antichrist. <clears throat> and... At that time, uh, this thought occurred to me, well, what about non-denominational people like us? And he said, oh, no, that could never happen to us. It's like, mm, we've seen in recent years how even the non-denominationals have come under the Pope. And non-denominational leaders have, have signed on with, with doctrines uh, you know, Cal hyper Calvinism and hyper grace and some of these other things that we look at the word and say, that's not right. Steve talked about this Friday night. It was like, well, how could that happen? Well, they're being deceived by the spirit of Antichrist that is in the world today. So, how do we avoid that? It tells you right here. Abide in his word. Have that daily 
communion, that daily quiet time between you and the Lord, then you will know the truth and you will be set free. Wow, what a promise. Really? Okay. Or just like it says in 2 Corinthians. Uh, because we continue to behold in the Word of God, the glory of God, we are transformed. The Word will do the changing in us. The Word will make us what we need to be. But we got to stay in it. We can't just put that in a box and say, yeah, I got that one. He did that years ago. Now I'm going to go on about and enjoy my life. Uh, that's a recipe for deception. Okay. Um, keep the place in John, but go back to Matthew chapter 16. So Jesus was commenting to Peter that Peter had gotten a revelation about who he, Jesus, was. And in verse 18, he says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it, shall not be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what the gates of hell are or what that means. Well, simply put, we know at least this much. In ancient times, uh, cities were walled for their protection. And that the gates was kind of like what the courthouse would, or the federal building or something would be in our world today. That, that's where, in the Old Testament, where the, the leaders of the city would come out and, you know, when um, Boaz uh, took Ruth to be his wife and, you know, she was actually the inheritance of his brother who had died or something, or his nephew, I guess it was that they had to go before the, the elders of the city at the city's gates. Well, what he's telling you here is something really important. Is Satan, like it says in 1 John 5, 19, rules this whole planet. So if we're coming to his gates, that's him trying to keep us out of his regime on planet earth. Whatever you want to call that. You can call it the deep state. You can call it the global elite. You can call it the, the military industrial complex. You can call it the Illuminati. You can call it uh, Mary Jane Dorcas. I don't care. But that's, that's his regime, and he keeps out those he does not want in that. And it says that those gates will not prevent us from moving into where God says we are to be. And he says in verse 19, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth must be what is bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth must be what is loosed in heaven. Now we've been practicing this a lot on the personal level. You know, in terms of demon spirits that are in us or that are oppressing us or our loved ones, that's fine. This business of discerning between Christ and Antichrist works on the personal level, but it also works out there. What he's telling you here in verse 19 is not just, well, if you know there's a demon of such and such, then, then uh, loose it. Okay, he's, he is telling you that for sure. But... He's also telling you there are some things that are improper and you need to have discernment of those and you need to reject those things and you need to come against them. So I guess we could put another thing up here. What is proper? You know, he, he does, could mean lawful, but we'll just use the word proper. I think the, the uh, Amplified Bible says it right. Between what is proper and what is improper? Well, how do we know what's what? Well, start with the Bible. If the Bible says it's not proper for two people of the same gender to have sexual relations, then we go with that. 
even if they say, well, it is proper, we say it's legal, and if you say it's not, then you, you've, you've committed a crime against the state. Well, that's improper. So we go with what the Bible says. That's what's proper. That's in, implied here in verse 19, verse 20. But then, now look at this. Then Jesus sternly and strictly charged and warned the disciples... This message didn't go forth to the crowds. This message went forth to the disciples. He warned them to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, I've read that many times and I thought, well, wait a minute. That was his whole point of, of God sending him to the earth was to be the Christ, to be the anointed one. So... Why was he telling them, well, don't tell anybody that I'm that? Well, keep the place here. Go to Luke chapter 24. Here's one reason. There may be several reasons, really, why he wanted them not to do that at that particular time. For example, you know, he knew that, that Herod and the Pharisees and that a lot of his enemies were, were out to kill him and it was not his time to go. So he didn't want to uh, invite any unnecessary uh, trouble. Okay, there's that for sure. But here's another deeper reason why he would not want everybody out there saying, oh, he's the Christ. Like, why would he not want that right then? Even though he was displaying God's power and speaking God's word, doing the works that God told him to do, why would he not want them to say, oh, well, he's the Christ, because look at all this he's doing. Well, here's one reason. Luke chapter 24, verse mm, 17. This is after he has resurrected, but they don't know it yet. And so he's walking along outside Jerusalem and verse 17, he comes upon these two people. And he says, well, what is this discussion that you're exchanging among yourselves as you walk along? And they stood still looking sad and downcast. And then one of them named Cleopas answered him, do you alone dwell as a stranger in Jerusalem and not know the things that have occurred here in these days? And he said to them, well, what things? And they said to him, about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in work and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers gave him up to be sentenced to death and crucified him. But, pay attention here, but we were hoping that it was he who would redeem and set Israel free. Their idea of Christ was a political leader. You know, if that's all it is, a lot of people were looking to Donald Trump to be a Christ. Even a lot of Christians were looking to Donald Trump to be a Christ in that sense. Or go to John chapter 6. Well, why would they do that? Why wouldn't they see beyond just that, just the, the political dimension of things? Because they were controlled by the mind of the flesh, like what Steve talked about Friday night. Here's a perfect example. John chapter 6, verse 11. So Jesus took loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples, um, from the disciples to the reclining people. So he did also with the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had all had enough, he said to the disciples, gather up now the fragments, the broken pieces that are left over, so that nothing may be lost or wasted. And accordingly, they gathered them up, 
so that they filled 12 baskets with the fragments left over by those who had eaten from the five barley loaves. This was a, mir a miracle. And I think they must have known that it was a miracle. I mean, how could they not? It says, and when the people saw the miracle and that Jesus had performed, they began saying, well, surely and beyond a doubt, this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they wanted to come and seize him, that they might make him king, withdrew again to the hillside by himself alone. Well, it's like, well, Jesus, you could have, you, you know, just leapfrogged over the whole crucifixion, resurrection thing and gone to the millennial kingdom right then. But would he have fulfilled God's plan? No. So, what could we say about this? I'm not sure that, I'm not sure I know exactly what word I would describe this, but uh, maybe we'll say spiritual. versus fleshly. Now, for me to posit this dichotomy does not mean that God is not interested with the needs of our flesh. Nor does it mean that the devil cannot do things that are purely in the spiritual realm. You know, several people have been talking this week. I think Tom was talking about it today, and this is not the first one I've heard. I was hearing several people last week telling me that last week they, they felt this unease in the spirit. Well, that's something that the devil is doing, but it is spiritual. Okay, so for me to say spiritual means that it is accomplishing something beyond just the natural. Whereas what the devil does, uh, a natural Christ, a political leader, see this, okay, I'm going to make a political statement here. <laughs> Jesus' name, this won't get me kicked off of YouTube. But <clears throat> the problem with the church vis-a-vis -vis Donald Trump was that somehow they thought by him getting elected and by espousing Republican platform ideals that it was going to spiritually transform America. Did it? Actually quite the opposite. Okay? So at the best you could say that but by doing that, by building a border wall or by, you know, uh, easing restrictions or this or that, it might have made things better for some people in some ways, but it was all natural. That, that did not make America a more spiritually great place again. And if he was able to do everything that he said he was going to do, which, by the way, a president can't do that. Because presidents are selected, they are not elected. Okay, but if he even were able to to circumvent all the powers that be behind the office, then it still would have all been natural. It it would not have been that he would not have promoted a na national revival to to get everybody on their knees and repent of their sins. Right? I mean, he at all the time he was going to court trying to to cover his own sins. Still doing that. Just saying. Signs and wonders do not prove that something is of God. Go to Second Thessalonians chapter two. You can let the place in John go. Nor would we say that signs and wonders per se prove that something is Christ rather than Antichrist. Clearly, because here in 2 Thessalonians, talking about the Antichrist. 
2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 says, Let no one deceive you or beguile you in any way. For the day of the Lord will not come except the apostasy comes first, which is the great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, who is the son of doom, of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and insolently against all that is of God or that is worshipped, even to his actually taking his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming that he himself is God. Verse 9, And the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is through the activity and working of Satan and will be attended by great power and all sorts of miracles. Now, I know the Amplified puts that word pretended in there. Okay, just because it's false doesn't mean that it's an illusion. Yes, he can do elusive things, but this goes beyond mere illusion. This, this goes beyond um, circumventing power and perverting it and misusing it for another purpose. All sorts of miracles, signs, and delusive wonders, and by unlimited seduction to evil, with all wicked deception, for those who are perishing, going to perdition, going to hell, in fact, because they did not welcome the truth, but refused to love it, that they might be saved. Well, that right there tells you something that Calvinists seem to disagree with. Seem to. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a misunderstanding in here somewhere. But this says that if anybody goes to hell, it's because they were presented the truth and they rejected it. What does that tell you? It tells you they have a choice. It wasn't, well, God just determined you're going to go to hell and you don't have any choice in the matter. That's wrong. Otherwise, this, this wouldn't make any sense. They were presented the truth and they refused it. That means they had a choice. But you see, the reason that they refused it is because this other person over here, this other being, says, I'm God and did miracles, and they were convinced that was the right way, and that all what you Christians are saying, y'all just messed up. You, you know, you, you're stupid or you're crazy. You don't know. This guy's the real deal. So they rejected Jesus. They were presented with the option, and they rejected it. See, this is, keep this in mind. God gives us options. He gives us a choice. Okay. Go to first, no, go to Psalms. Psalm 2. See, not only does miracles not prove something is of God, power and authority in this world does not prove someone is of God. Here again, there are those in the body of Christ who take scriptures like Romans 13, where it says no power exists except by God's permission, or what Nebuchadnezzar said there in, uh, in Daniel chapter 4, and it says, well, God raises up one and he puts down another and build a doctrine saying, well, all, all, all earthly power was put there by God. No. The fact that people have, uh, have to be led is, is in the nature of things. And God has not changed that. In fact, even in the millennial kingdom, that will not be changed because Jesus will be ruling and there will be those who rule and reign under him. Well, what are they ruling and reigning over? The grasshoppers? <laughs> no, they're ruling and reigning over other people. That's why we are called the sheep of his pasture. 
God doesn't intend, you know, one of the things that was wrong in Israel, it says, well, there was no king among them, so everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Sort of sounds like that hockey team you're talking about. It's like when people are left just, you know, you do whatever you want to, there's chaos. So God doesn't want there to be chaos. He didn't create us to be chaotic beings. Okay, so there is rank and order. There is, uh, you know, divine authority. There's sacred covering, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, I mean, I could go on in that. That's a whole sermon in itself. But here is proof that having earthly political power does not mean that you are of God. See, that's another thing, you know, that Cleopas and Mary thought, well, if he was the Messiah, then he would have taken the power and Israel would be back like it was under King David and everything would be hunky-dory. He'd make Israel great again. Right? Okay, Psalm 2, verse 2. The kings of the earth. Talking about those who are in authority. The kings of the earth take their places and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. That's anti-Christ. Against the Lord and against His anointed one. Well, what you're saying, all the governments are anti-Christ. They're going to end up that way. They're going that direction now. I guess I, I, guess I would say they don't have to be. But God knows the end from the beginning, and this is prophecy here. They take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed one, the Christ. They're anti-Christ. And they say, well, let us break their bands. Whose bands? God, Jesus, the body of Christ. Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords of control from us. Well, you know, that almost sounds like, if you don't look deep enough, that almost sounds like what the founding fathers did back in uh, the 1700s when, when they, uh, you know, had the revolution against England because England had a church, a state church, and they, they um, put it in the in the, the Bill of Rights that, that there would be no uh, government mandated religion, that America would not be a theocracy. So, you know, those who would be of that, uh, of this mindset here in Psalm 2 verse 3, and they're saying, well, we just, we just don't want there to be a theocracy like there is over in Iran and some of these other places. Well, you know, that, that almost sounds good until you realize that what they're going to put in its place is a tyranny. And it is a theocracy. It's just worshiping a different God. You know, a secular government worships a different God. I mean, you know, communist Russia uh, worshipped uh, the state. They said the state is God. Okay, and in Iran, uh, they, they are, are under Allah. Well, folks, Allah is not our Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a false God. Okay, so other governments, you know, that, that, that are afraid that the Christians are going to take over and, and mandate that, that, you know, women can't wear makeup and this and that and the other, you know. Well, they, they're going to put something else in its place that, that's a lot worse than not wearing makeup. Uh, let, me, let me posit it this way. An antichrist regime will be dominating. Now I have a little bit more to say about this in a different message because people are primed for this. You know, that which is is powerful, that which is loud, that which is macho, rules the day among people. That's just the way people are. The devil, the devil capitalizes on that. Well, then what's the alternative? Well, turn 
to Luke chapter 22. Verse 24. Now an eager contention rose among them as to which of them would be considered and reputed to be the greatest. They're having a political campaign. <laughs> they were running for an office here, an imaginary office at that. Okay. But there was eager contention. I mean, I bet there was some fisticuffs going on there with this. But Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles are deified by them, and they exercise lordship, ruling as emperor gods over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors and well-doers. See, in the world, those who are dominating and controlling are called heroic. Make another political statement here. When the church was saying that Donald Trump was the man because he was strong and he would speak his mind even though it helped the whole crowd, as we would say. Is that right? I mean, does that prove somebody is of God just because they're strong and they're, they're brazen and they're loud-mouthed? Well, then why did the church think that that was God's anointed just because of that? I mean, of all the things they could have found about Donald Trump that would have, you know, seemed like he was the better choice over Hillary Clinton, yeah. that was not the one. Okay? So, what does Jesus have to say about that? Verse 26, But it is not so to be among you. In other words, Jesus is saying, Don't be like Donald Trump. Let me read it to you. It is not so to be like you. On the contrary, let him who is the greatest among you be like the youngest, and him who is chief and leader like one who serves. What do we call that? We will call that servant leader, servanthood. I will say this. I mean, I, I, I abhor the politics of the Democratic Party. I do. I have not voted for a Democrat since 1972, and I probably won't ever again. But I will say this about Joe Biden. He puts on a pretty good act of being a servant. Of course, he's really just a puppet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's actually a shell, if you, in my opinion. But... At least, at least that, that is the model that Jesus wants us to be. Right, there's a jack in the White House. Well, there's a, there's, a, uh, uh, there's, there's a guy with dementia in the White House. Okay. For who is greatest, the one who reclines at table, the master, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But... I am in your midst as one who serves. Well, how did Jesus serve? Well, he gave his life for us. Isaiah chapter 53. You know, Herbert Hoover, who was by most Americans' opinion, one of the worst presidents that America ever had because they blamed him for the, for the Great Depression when really it was the tycoons that caused the Great Depression. Herbert Hoover refused to receive a salary for being president. And that's where Donald Trump got his idea for that. But what are we saying here? We're saying that 
There are advantages. You know what I was saying to go to Isaiah 53? I think a better place. In Isaiah 53 verse 5 it says, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. The chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon Him. And with the stripes that wounded Him, we are healed and made whole. Or as it says in Philippians chapter 2, this is what a servant leader is. And this, this is something I don't know that any of us can just decide we're going to do. This is something that only the Spirit of Christ in us can do. Philippians 2 verse 5, Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus who although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing all the fullness of the attributes which make God, God. I mean, you talk about power. That's ultimate power. That's sovereign power. That's power over the universe. It says, He did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. Not like those disciples who were eagerly trying to decide who was going to be the greatest. But he stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant in that he became like men and was born a human being. Well, you talk about a demotion. I don't think we fully appreciate what Jesus did, not just in you know, suffering there on the cross for those hours, but what he did in leaving that heavenly dignity and becoming like us. He didn't sin. I mean, that's a big one right there. How can you be like us and not sin? <laughs> All have sinned, but he didn't. But he became like us. Said he was subjected to all of the same attacks from the devil. Whatever you're going through, Jesus went through that in spades. And it says in verse 8, And after that He appeared in human form, He abased Himself even further and carried His obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. Well, that's what we honor today when we observe the Lord's Supper. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's servant leadership. Because it says there in the next verse that God exalted Him and gave Him the name that is above every name. You know what? I don't want a name that's above every name. I just want to be uh, folded in under His name. I want to carry the name of Christ with integrity. I want to carry the name of Christ with dignity, with truth, with humility, with compassion. I want to be a good example of what a Christian is supposed to be. Because the world has had plenty of bad examples of what a Christian is supposed to be. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord himself that which I passed on to you. It was given to me personally that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was treacherously delivered up and while his betrayal was in progress took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. I want to point out something else here that should be obvious. He did this with his disciples. He didn't do this out on the hillside with thousands of people. For us to really receive of all the benefit of the new covenant of what he paid for, we need to be his disciple. And 
when he had broken it, he gave thanks, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this to call me affectionately to remembrance. And when supper was ended, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it to call me affectionately to remembrance. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are representing and signifying and proclaiming the fact of the Lord's power and omnipotence. So that's not what it says, is it? You're proclaiming the Lord's death. You're proclaiming what we read there in Philippians 2. You're proclaiming what Christ really is. When we, when we receive the Lord's Supper, we are, we are proclaiming this is what God wants and we want to be like that. We are proclaiming the Lord's death until He comes. So then whoever drinks, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in a way that's unworthy of Him will be guilty of profaning and sinning against the body of the Lord. You know, I've, I've seen this in the past as well. If, we just, if this is just a religious ritual, then we're sinning against Him. Yes, that's true. But, if we don't see Jesus as the, as the, the servant and we see him as he, he's something that, that can empower us to, to go out and, you know, beat up on those bad guys out there, that's participating in an unworthy manner. Let a man thoroughly examine himself and when he has done so, and only when he has done so, should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discriminating and recognizing with due appreciation that it's Christ's body, eats and drinks a sentence, a verdict of judgment upon himself. That careless and unworthy participation is the reason many of you are weak and sickly. And quite enough of you have fallen into the sleep of death. Well, guess what? Christians have been weak and sickly and dying for 2,000 years. So this is a problem that affects every Christian. This, this, oh, ask for somebody else. No, I, I, I appreciate what the, what the Lord's Supper is about. It's not just a ritual for me. Well, wait a minute. There's more. There's more to understand about taking Christ in us. We sing the song, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Are y'all experiencing glory? Well, maybe, you know, over here in this area and over there in that area, but there is more. It says if we behold Him in the Word, we are transformed. This is what God wants. He doesn't want us to just stay static. He doesn't want to just, well, if I just stay like I am now and maybe have a, you know, fall asleep and, and die and go to heaven, then I'll be happy. That's not what He wants. He wants us glorified. It says that in the 8th chapter of Romans, that those He called, He justified, and those He justified, He glorified. There's a sermon there. It says in verse 31, For if we would searchingly examine ourselves, detecting our shortcomings and re re recognizing our own condition, we shall not be judged and penalty decreed. What he's asking us to do is let's make sure that in us there's none of this and that we are striving after that. And if we recognize that there's this, any of this in us, and there is in all of us, I'm sure, we repent. So that's what we're going to do here in a moment. Because in verse 32 it says, But if we fall short and are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined and chastened, so that we may not be condemned to eternal punishment along with the world. So I want you to pray this prayer with me, and then we'll have the emblems.